Today, the scripture readings invite us to reflect. How do we transmit the Christian faith to those who have no religion or to those who do not have the same background in terms of biblical tradition? Certainly, we cannot transmit the gospel in the same way as we speak to people that share the biblical tradition. And even those who share the biblical tradition, some parts of the Old Testament, it has to be done differently. And so today we have the first reading where St. Paul went to Athens. Athens, of course, was a philosophical center for the intelligentsia. But at the same time, Athens was truly a place where there is a worship of idolatry. They believe in many gods. There were many temples, many statues. And so St. Paul, who went to Athens, he was dealing with a different group of people. People who have these superstitious beliefs in the many gods. At the same time, certain philosophical trends that were determining those people who were part of the intelligentsia, who perhaps not so superstitious like the rest. And so to address this group of people, St. Paul had to use a different discourse altogether. And the discourse that St. Paul used was that of basically the Greek philosophers, namely of Socrates. Socrates' way of discussion is one of dialogue, question and answers. And that is why St. Paul today used a different method. When speaking to the Jews, he could use the Old Testament, he could preach, but to the Athenians, it was not possible. And so he began from where they were. And so he used the beautiful example of what he saw, that the people were very religious, and they have an altar inscribed to an unknown God. And so his task was to lead them to ask, who is this unknown God? And the truth is this, God, although is worshipped in many forms uh, for the philosophers, uh, this God is an impersonal God. There were basically two philosophical trends when St. Paul was in Athens. We have the Stoics, we have the Epicureans. The Epicureans are those people today. Most of our generations, actually, we belong to this philosophical tradition of Epicureans, which means to say, you ask people in this secular world where they don't believe in God, what is life? Life is to enjoy, to have pleasure, and try to avoid all forms of pain. So if you have pain, then we try to apply relief. So long as you are not in pain and you are enjoying life, that is what life is all about. There is nothing else to look for in life except for pleasure and freedom from suffering, from anxiety, from fear. So this is the Epicurean way of living life to the fullest. Although they believe in gods, but they say these gods are so remote. They are not interested in our life. We just learn how to enjoy. And that is how the world today lives. So long as we have enough money, we have good health, we can go holidays, we eat, sleep, and that's it. That is Epicurean system of living life to the fullest. Then we have the Stoics. Their whole life was to try to respond to the reality of this world. In other words, they also believe in God, but this God is an impersonal God because this God is like a retired architect, huh? He created this world, but we do not know where he is. Huh? So you just have to listen. Huh? But actually, this God is not so much a creator God, even for the Stoic. It is the world spirit. It's a soul. The Stoics are pantheistic. The world is God, in other words. So since the world is God, you just accept what is happening. Huh? Don't fight against it. If you are going through a difficult time, just learn to accept. Just learn to endure. Just dance with nature, in other words. Huh? If you are sick, then you just have to accept you are sick. Huh? Do what you can, but 
that is part of life. Don't complain. Uh. No need to pray to God because this God, He is retired. So you just have to live and let live. Uh. Do what you can. Just accept. Uh. Don't uh, complain. No point complaining because nobody is going to listen to you anyway. So, St. Paul, therefore, when he resented this unknown God, what was his story? His story is this unknown God is not a pantheistic God. It's not an impersonal God. This God is a personal God. He is known, actually. He is known, beginning with natural theology, using creation. He says, this God, first and foremost, is the creator God. He made the world. It is not that the world just comes to be as it is. It is God who created the world. And because he got created the world, he doesn't need to live in shrines and doesn't live in houses. The whole world is his place. But of course, he goes beyond the world because if you say that the world is equal to God, it's pantheism. Eh? So God is greater than this world. Then he says, not only God is the creator, God is also the sustainer of life. He doesn't need anything. I eh? don't think if you offer him some flowers and some candles, he'll be very happy. I mean, all these things, uh, this is more expression of love. God doesn't need all these things. Then, the thirdly, this God is also a ruler. God is a judge. He is in control, in other words. Because for the Stoics, for the Epicureans, God is in person, no control. But they say, He is the ruler. And so, therefore, because He's the ruler, He's the judge. Therefore, this world is somehow under his control. Don't think that the world is out of control. God is in control. And finally, St. Paul also says, not in this God is a judge, but this God is actually our Father. We are all his children, and he lives in us. We lived in him. So this God is actually a God that we can relate to. So beautiful, huh? this personal God. But of course, we know that not all religions believe in a personal God. There are many religions today, they believe that God is impersonal. So everything was fine until he said, you know, the judge is Jesus. How do we know that judge is Jesus? Because God raised him from the dead. And of course, some of them burst out laughing. That was a bit too much. So when he was using natural theology, using the reason, so to speak, at least it was still acceptable. I mean, they were trying to see from Paul's point of view, basing from their existential situation. But when he spoke of the resurrection, they burst out laughing because it was an absurd idea. And this is my point. You know, when we deal with people who are secularists, agnostic, or whether people of other faiths, there are limits. It doesn't mean to say that we will be able to convert them using reason alone you come to a certain level of acceptance. Sometimes we can agree, sometimes we cannot agree. With people of other faith, we have more to agree with than people without faith. So with the other religions, when we have dialogue with them, there is no intention, so to speak, of proselytizing. The dialogue with other religions is to help us to understand each other religion, where we are coming from, where is the point of departure of our faith where we appreciate the different religious traditions and to see how we can be enriched by their practices, by their faith, by their lifestyle. But all religions, somehow, we will agree on very fundamental issues on charity, on compassion, on forgiveness, etc. and so on. So these are the things that will unite us to help us to build humanity into a harmonious, peaceful humanity. But that is the furthest we can get. Beyond that, it's very difficult to come to an agreement because at the end of the day, it is a matter of faith, a matter of experience, your upbringing, your encounter with God. So if you encounter God in your religious tradition, that will be your tradition. So, ultimately, as in today's gospel, Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but there will be too much for you now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will lead you to the complete truth. So, because it is a matter of faith, we can only share our faith, we can proclaim our faith, but actually, it is the Lord who will touch them, the Spirit who will open their hearts, the Spirit will open their minds. Of course, we have a part to play in living out our faith and 
when they are more receptive to what we share, they might be attracted to see that there is something there. And just like what we read in today's first reading, some of them, after hearing him, invited him. They say, let us speak more about it. And gradually became believers. But of course, we know that the mission of St. Paul at Athens was a failure. In fact, very few accepted the gospel. But still, there were a few who were receptive. And I think this is true, especially when we dialogue with secularists, people of other religions. I think what is important for us is that at least there should be some kind of fundamental agreement. Because at the end of the day, we want to build a harmonious, loving, a peaceful a society. And that is also part of our calling as sons and daughters of God in this one big family. But again, as I said, let us be aware there are limitations. So don't think that we can really argue our faith and make someone convinced. If your point of departure is not faith in God, you don't have faith in the Bible, why should I believe that human beings are created men and women? Why should I believe that marriage is between one man and one woman? There are many places practice polygamy. So, it's your point of departure. If you believe that Jesus is the resurrected Lord, and Jesus who is the Word of God, then of course then we believe everything in the Bible, even though we might not agree personally, or we might not understand, because Jesus is God. Then if you want to explain logically, of course there are reasons we can explain logically, but to a certain level. After that, it needs the leap of faith. So reason can only bring us that far. But at the end of the day, we can still disagree because if it's just reason, we can come from many perspectives, many vantage points, and we will never come to agreement. So that is the reason why I say, especially for people who do not accept our faith or do not understand our faith, there is only one way to lead them to the faith. It is to open the door, to make them be receptive to what we want to share. The day when they are receptive, then we have already planted the seed of faith and the seed of faith grows. And this is true, especially in offices, in schools particularly, we are sowing the seed of faith. These people, when they are in school, when they were young, of course, uh, they never thought about religion. But later on, when they're in their 30s, 40s, or even in their 80s, uh, when they are so near to God, immediately they ask, wow, my time is near, so where will I be going? Then they will be asking, will lead them to Jesus. Jesus.